My name is Alan Silver. I'm here with my co-author of David Lean and his films, James Ursini, to talk about Hobson's Choice. Hobson's Choice is David Lean's uh, film in 1954, which was uh, the, su the subject and the play was brought to him by Alexander Corda, whose logo you just saw at the beginning there, London Films. Corda was the uh, luminary of the British cinema during the sort of doldrum days of the 1930s where the British cinema was basically in the shadow of the American cinema. He was one of the producers that created international classics like Private Life of Henry VIII and Rembrandt, both starring Charles Lawton, who stars in this film. He had worked with Ling on uh, Soundbury the year before, which was an extremely successful film and financially and critically. And so they wanted to work together. Corda brought him this play, Hobson's Choice, which had been in a warhorse of the theater for, since 1915 when it premiered in the United States, actually. It had the elements of romance, which Lean was interested in doing, having centered on that in a number of films before, most notably Brief Encounter with Noel Coward. And it also had a tradition of uh, a comic success on the theater, so they thought it would be a, a good project to uh, work together on. Lean had, of course, established his international career with films like Great Expectations and Oliver Twist. We should say this is Lean's last film in black and white, his last portrayal of period England. It's sort of the concluding installment of this informal series of period movies that he did, Great Expectations, Oliver Twist, Madeline. You've got the wind sweeping down this set. You've got a cobble street. You've got the black boot hanging forebodingly at the top of the frame. And you've got camera pulling back past this trade sign. You've got the rusty hinges making noise, flickering lamp. It's all sort of a very dramatic setup, even though most of the people that came to see this movie knew that it was a comedy. And what you have here is something that's very close to the startling expressionistic prologue of Oliver Twist. It's much more like that than the documentary style of Madeline. Here you have the first sort of comic touch. You've got this thing that uh, Malcolm Arnold called the shoe ballet with lighter music as you go across the shoes, but the, the lighting is still a sort of low key, somewhat expressionistic lighting. And the traveling shot still gives you this sort of sense of foreboding. You really don't know what's going on. It's obviously very different in a play that opens with the characters on stage and immediately goes into dialogue. It's Lean immediately sort of imposing a restricted vision and generating the viewer's genre expectations towards something. You got the pan, the branch hitting the window. It's all saying what's going to happen. Is something dramatic going to happen? Finally, after you have this slow move back, shadow on the floor, figure in the doorway, it's something, except he belches. So, you know, it reveals that Hobson's just a, a plain drunk and Hobson's choice is a comedy. The send-up of this film is really a send-up of the Victorian films that he had done before, like as Alan mentioned. Not only Oliver Twist, but Great Expectations and Madeline, both of which had dynamic visual openings. The only thing that cues you that this is going to be a comedy before the burp is, of course, the music hall, the English music hall music that Malcolm Arnold incorporates into the beginning. So this gives you the idea that even though it looks very expressionistic and mysterious, that it's going to be a pretty raucous comedy. The, the, the main part of this is to also try to uh, make the, f the play by Harold Brighouse more visual than obviously it was on the stage. So you have scenes like this where he's using angle and uh, composition to create comic dynamics. Um, the Charles Lawton character is, of course, very over the top, which is a tradition in Lawton's performances. And a lot of the critics panned the film because of that. They thought that Lawton was just too much. Uh, lean considers this performance one of his favorite performances and didn't see that at all and loved, Lee, loved uh, Lawton throughout the whole film and his performances. And Lawton's really pretty much doing the play. I mean, the, the character of Henry Hobson in the play is sort of pompous, often a blowhard, very controlling. What I think you said about, you know, the, the precipitous run up the stairs towards the camera creates a quick dynamic. And it also sets up that little throwaway visual pun or the Statue of Liberty. It shows that Hobson, when he's drunk, is looser, has more of a sense of humor, 
And that's all we've seen so far. The other thing that I think is interesting is Lean's movies are often focused on a point of view. And here, right from the second sequence, he's fracturing that. We're cutting away to all sorts of minor characters, clearly establishing a third person. And in the opening scene, we had two characters. Again, Lawton is the star. You think you're going to be in his point of view. But in fact, it's Maggie, his daughter, that's really going to carry the movie. The uh, use of locations combined with the sound studios is very uh, effective in this film. And, of course, he used the same thing in other movies Lean had made before. Uh, they actually shot in Salford, which is the setting of the original play by Brighouse uh, in the Lancaster area, north of London. The whole attempt to combine the reality of the town with the sort of reality created in the studios is very effective. Particularly, it was designed by Wilford Shingleton, who had worked on Great Expectations with Lean and later would work on prestigious films like African Queen. Cortins like that, my lass. All glitter and no use to nobody. Yes, Father? And uh, the attempt to create this sort of industrial town at the beginning of the 20th century uh, by combining locations with uh, actual settings within the sound within the studio itself is very effective. Well, I think it's a carrying on the tradition that Lynn established in both Oliver Twist and Great Expectations, and actually less bound with the soundstage than than Madeline was. Where you know the whole last third of that takes place in a courtroom. Obviously, the shop is the very prominent location. It's two of the four settings in the play. But besides going in tighter, obviously, I think here Lean uses a very effective technique. It's not a sequence shot. It's a long take that's going to last for half of the sequence. And the dynamic aspects of it are enhanced by the fact that Lean carefully chooses the cutting point. We've carried Prosser in, so he talks to Alice. Then he comes back, and suddenly Maggie's standing there in front of him. Clearly, immediately, we're, we're away from stagecraft and into the kind of cinematic staging that Lean had brought to the other period pictures. He pulls back, and the cut is to Hobson. So very quickly, Lean has very subtly established a dynamic conflict in the whole movie between Maggie and Hobson, using a cut from a slightly long take. As soon as she starts walking back... You know that you and Alice are making yourselves a laughing stock at Salford. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm bringing up question of... Pernod Scales here plays uh, Vicky, which is the sort of younger, softer daughter. She, of course, is famous for 100 TV shows that she did for the BBC, but most famous over here in the United States for playing John Cleese's wife in Faulty Towers in the 1970s. She sort of refutes the belief that Lean was uh, disliked actors, which was a myth about Lean and said that he was very kind and worked extensively with her and that he was authoritarian, of course, but he was a perfectionist, which is part of the lean uh, uh, ethos, is to make his films as perfect as possible, which you see in things like uh, this film, but even much more extreme, of course, in his epics like Lawrence of Arabia and, and uh, Ryan's Daughter. Father, you're not in Moonrakers now. Comfortable? I think we ought to say that, you know, lean's reputation as a perfectionist goes back to the beginning of his career, but clearly here in his second project with Corda, he's the producer and the director. He's very conscious of the budget and the shooting time. It was shot over a long period, but it was budgeted for that, and Lean was essentially uh, conscientious in terms of staying on budget. Um, his reputation for doing otherwise obviously begins a little bit with Kwai and continues with Lawrence. But all of his projects up to this point had essentially been on budget and, and very efficiently produced. It's a long way off dinner time. So that if you stay too long in the Moonrakers, you'll be late for it. Moonrakers? Who's that? If your dinner's ruined, it'll be your own fault. The, we should also say here that we haven't mentioned yet one of the major themes of this play, and of course the movie, which is, follows the play very closely, is feminism or the suffragette movement uh, of the period when the original play was written. This is very much about power dynamics uh, between the father, the sort of patriarchal father, and the three daughters, particularly the Brenda DeBanzi character, Maggie, uh, who is central to this film. And in many ways, it's her film. He, he, in the shots, in the compositions, and in the dialogue itself, he's always attempting to establish control. And so it's really about, in many ways, men's fear of the new power of women, the sort of new woman of the uh, early 
uh, 1900s. And Maggie epitomizes that. And Brenda DeBanzi, who played the part, said that that was one of the things that attracted her to this film was the the very powerful, strong woman who who is really dominant over her father, eventually defeats her father, and then, of course, infuses this sort of blank slate of a man, Willie Mossop, with the same sort of power that she has. And uh, that's very much a major theme in this. And you can see it in the compositions, the way he plays the three daughters against the father. And, uh, of course, Lawton is all bluster and um, threats, but ultimately shows up to be sort of uh, empty. Well, the other thing I think that Lean has consistently done from his earliest pictures is been very conscious about framing, especially his two shots, to try and establish the dynamics. He uses lighting, position, and the frame and angle to suggest the sort of shifting relationships in terms of character dominance. Obviously here, you know, this is a balanced shot, but what you really have is a very animated portrayal by Lott and a very calm and centered portrayal by Brenda DeBanzi. So that, again, you've got a reinforcement of the central conflict in terms of the two characters. People know really who the two principles are in terms of the emotional conflict. The other thing we should say is, you know, this is a play from 19... From, from essentially the World War I era, but it's actually set in Salford, which is where Brighouse was from, in 1880. And essentially, Brighouse is in the play himself, the character Beanstalk, who's in love with Vicky, who works for his father in the corn chandlery, um, is based on Brighouse himself, who initially worked for his father in a textile wholesale company. Did you wish to see the identical workman, madam? And this is, quite, this is a very wonderful sequence where the sort of rabbit in the hole, uh, Willie Mossop is referred to as a rabbit by uh, Mrs. Hepworth, who's the rich lady. It's a wonderful sequence because he emerges from the darkness of his shop and below where he's doing making these wonderful boots, uh, like a little rabbit blinking at the light. And this is the first uh, image we have of Willie Mossop, who becomes a central character as the way that the Brendan DeBanzi character, Maggie, escapes the restrictions of her father and sort of the patriarchal society through this man, using him as sort of a front for her. And also we see for the first time how she tries to establish that there's a connection between them because Maggie defends, what well, doesn't defend him, it gives an excuse for why he can't read the card. And in fact, he can't read, he's illiterate, but she doesn't want to embarrass him. Also the dominance of Mrs. Hepworth is established in this scene. Again, another woman, another powerful woman, a rich woman who is rare, knows what she wants and eventually even gets Hobson to sort of bend to her demands, you know, and to de even bend literally down on his knees before her when he's looking at her boot. So again, it's this theme of the new woman or the feminism or suffragette movement, whatever you want to call it, is very much in evidence here. He's a treasure, and I expect you underpay him. That'll do, Willie. You can go. Yes. He's like a rabbit. The other thing I think we, we talked about Will Mossop, the character, is the fact that originally this was to be uh, a different actor, uh, Robert Donat, whose ill health uh, prevented him from participating. And Lean made the unusual choice of John Mills, with whom he'd worked before several times, most recently in Great Expectations, and convinced him to portray a very different type of character, um, one that he would ultimately repeat for Lean uh, in his Academy Award winning portrayal in Ryan's Daughter sometime later. But you have John Mills sort of completely effacing himself, um, not at all concerned with his aspect and giving Lean exactly what he wants in terms of the animalistic imagery of him coming up out of the hole. The battle here is between temperance and alcoholism, which constantly reappears. His constant trips to the pub is a way of being a, a big fish in a little pond, which he refers to later, and, and is constantly walking by Beanstalk, who has the temperance sign there and always looks on him very judgmentally, uh, is really a battle that existed in these new industrial cities in the north, uh, like Manchester. Uh, which uh, was between this growing alcoholism among the workers of the, of the towns and also this temperance movement, which existed simultaneously. And of course, here it's drawn for, for comic purposes. Uh, the scenes in the pub, though, are used largely for 
this attempt to sh to show what kind of a character Hobson really is, that he is all bluster and he's all bravado and that there's an emptiness inside of him which he tries to fill with alcohol. And, and the alcohol theme becomes a little even more significant towards the end when the scene with the doctor by the end of the movie. Can I smoke now? The adapters have also done two things. They've taken the character Jim Healer, that's the guy on the left, portrayed by Joe Tomalty, and broken him into three different people. Uh, the other thing in the pub is initially, anyway, I mean, this is, as you've said, Hobson's escape from what he sees as the uppishness and back talk of his three daughters into an atmosphere where he's comfortable and can be somewhat at ease. But as the movie progresses, each trip to the pub is going to become more and more difficult for Hobson because um, his cronies who drink with him don't really necessarily give him the emotional support that he needs. And Lean's going to shift from these wide four shots of everybody sort of together and sharing the frame to uh, single shots that are going to isolate Hobson even inside the pub and sort of part of Lean's visual scheme of increasingly isolating Hobson in terms of his emotional position because he is emotionally backward. He's not a progressive man and he's going to spend the whole movie fighting uh, the social progress that the enfranchisement of his daughters represents. And also we should mention that Lawton actually played in Hobson's Choice when he was a youth, and he played the part of Willie Mossop. So it is a play that he was familiar with. Also, he was schooled in Lancaster, the city of Lancaster. One of the reasons Corder wanted him is because he could effectively use the accent of that area and uh, project it properly on the screen, which was important. That's one of the other reasons that Corda had wanted to use him. Plus, Corda had a relationship that went back to him, as we mentioned, all the way back to the early 1930s when, he, when Lawton won an Academy Award for Private Life of Henry VIII, which Corda had produced and directed. And then, of course, Rembrandt, and then the disastrous I, Claudius, which was the last collaboration between the two men. Lawton was always a difficult person to work with. I mean, every everyone who worked with him said it, because he was a, a bit of a diva and also a very conflicted man. I, you know, had a lot of, uh, saw himself as sort of this ugly, he called himself a pachyderm, the sort of ugly character, and so, alternated between these sort of sadistic parts, which this is to many degrees, um, and the sort of masochistic parts like uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. 60 pounds? Hmm. And then there'll be uh, settlements. Settlements. Marriage settlements, Henry. Me pay marriage settlements. 500 apiece for temperance folk. <laughs> <laughs> and so he brought a lot to the screen. It's just that he was so large, not only physically but emotionally, that often critics uh, panned his performances, even though by this time he was an international star. I mean, he was a star of the American cinema with Hunchback of Notre Dame and things like Salome where he played Herod and so forth. So he, he was definitely a, a plus in terms of selling the film, particularly to an American audience who would know Charles Lawton and might not know anyone else in the film itself. No, I don't think there's any question they wouldn't know anyone else. But I think the thing that we should say about Corda and London Films is a long-standing enterprise. What Corda had done is recruit international actors and technicians to London Films, tried to establish a level going back to when it was started, and continued that. I mean, he succeeded during the war in, in creating pictures that were war-specific, and the challenge after that, as British cinema lost its subsidy, was to find projects that could succeed, not just in England, where possibly there they would recoup most of the production costs, but could also succeed on the European continent and also in the United States, which was, of course, the largest market. So Lawton is the key to that. Lawton had spent all of the war years and the late 40s and early 50s working in the United States, and it's only at this point in his career that he became more of an international actor going back to London to work, uh, going various other places and, and continuing his stage work. We should also mention that uh, there was a great deal of conflict between Brendan DeBanzi and Charles Lawton on the set, according to Kevin Brunlow's biography of David Lean, uh, and that that was used by Lean in a way to carry over into the film itself. 
So the conflict here between them is a real conflict on an offstage level, which is then emotionally carried over onto the film itself, and may have a lot of the reason why the film is so effective in their performances. Brenda DeBanzi was an established stage actress uh, who was attracted to the part, as we said, because of the feminist uh, angle to it. And she's most famous uh, in this country for The Entertainer with Laurence Olivier, in which she won a Tony on the stage and then was nominated for many awards on the film version in 1960. I think the interesting thing about the way that Lean sustains the conflict early on is you, you had two scenes in the parlor there, one with Lawton telling his other two daughters in a very domineering manner that they can forget about getting married anytime soon if there's any question of settlements. He's not going to consider anything of that sort. And you have Maggie in her no-nonsense style telling him that, hey, she plans on getting married and um, she's just going to take care of it on her own. She doesn't need any assistance from her father, financial or otherwise. So as we've been saying, you have a proto-feminist character here. But I think what a lot of people don't understand about Lean and his work in general, since most are focused on the epic pictures, which are male-dominated in terms of the characters, uh, at least Chivago, Lawrence, and Quayar, is that half of Lean's pictures have female leads. Um, and the main characters are very ahead of their time in terms of their proto-feminist outlook. I mean, Lean's going to follow Hobson's choice with Summer Madness, um, again adapted from a play, uh, with Katherine Hepburn as the lead. And the last two pictures that Lean made, um, both Ryan's Daughter and Passage to India, uh, could essentially be said to be proto-feminist in terms of their main characters portrayed by Sarah Miles and Judy Davis. Also, the, the same themes run through, the same characters run through this character of, of Maggie as ran through Laura Jessup in Brief Encounter or Rosie Ryan in Ryan's Daughter or even Zhivago in, in Dr. Zhivago is the fact of that they're all dreamers on one level or another. And that's a very important concept for Lean. It runs through all of his movies that there's this dream and it may be a negative dream, it can be a positive dream, it may be a self-destructive dream as in Bridge and River Kwai. But it's still a dream. And so what she's doing here is she realizes that she cannot achieve the success she wants in the system that she's in, this turn-of-the-century uh, English system. And so now she has to bring forth someone who's going to act as her stand-in. And it has to be a male. So she picks this very, you know, illiterate blank slate, really, and decides she's going to infuse everything into him. And, and this is what she begins doing right here. themselves. The others, the bad boots other people make, and I sell. We had a pair, Will Mossop. You're a wonder at shop, Miss Maggie. You're a marvel in the workshop. Well? And the dream is her dream of being successful, and it eventually turns into a romantic dream, too, because 19th century romanticism was a great a theme that ran through all of Lean's work. Nature imagery, and which we'll see a little bit of in here a little bit later on. But also the whole idea that there's this ideal that you have to achieve, that there's this, this world of ideals and that you have to struggle for them. That runs through Rosie Ryan, Laura Jessup, uh, Catherine Hepburn in Summertime or Summer Madness, both titles. And we see her attempting to infuse that into this very submissive and beaten down shoemaker, bootmaker. I think what's different here in terms of the original material is that you have uh, an opening position which portrays Maggie Hobson more than Laura Jessup in Brief Encounter, more than Jane Hudson in Summertime, obviously more than the younger Rosie Ryan or um, even Laura in Zhivago as a pragmatist. I mean, her father said to her, you're 30 and shelved. And she essentially understands that society is saying that to her as well. And so she needs to take action. And she does so, I think, in a more direct and practical way than any other heroine in Lean's movies. The fact that she eventually succumbs to sort of innate romanticism of the institution of marriage and, if you want, Lean's worldview doesn't really contradict what's going on here, which is Lean taking the character in the play and pushing it much further initially, obviously using the actor and her performance to help put that across. And not just her performance, but also getting from John Mills a significant contrast with what Mossop is now and what Mossop will be at the end of the movie. Much more significant, I think, than you could achieve in the play, which 
isn't as much about Mossop. What Lean has done is sort of bring this character to the point where he's of equal importance to Hobson and Maggie. Put this notion from you. When I make arrangements, my lad, they're not for upsetting. You're walking out with me, Peel Park, Sunday. And I think Lean saw when uh, Donut couldn't do the film because of his health and couldn't be insured. Um, I think he saw that, that Mills was perfect for this because if you look at Great Expectations, his performance of, with as Pip is very, uh, there's a lot of comedy to it. And so he realized that he was capable of it. Even though Mills was mainly known for being sort of an everyman hero, leading man in, in British films before this with films like Scott of Antarctica and so forth. Uh, here we have the actual location of Salford and this Peel Park, which is a famous part of the, of the which is also mentioned in the play itself. Uh, again, Wilfred Shingleton did a great job on this, and Lean wanted him to do things like make it look dirtier than it was because the town fathers of Salford had actually spent a lot of time cleaning this place up by the 1950s, and so he went and wanted to muck it up more. So you'll see later on uh, in this scene where they're standing by the river that more and more gunk was thrown into the river to make Lean happy about uh, making it look like it might have looked in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, I mean, that, that scene's coming up immediately, and the, the river Irwell, um, which we dissolve to from this lovely geometric pattern. I mean, we go from this idealized setting to the factories, and this is where essentially Maggie has led him for the romantic moment, and you've got an ecological disaster here. Uh, yeah, on the other side of this wrought iron fence, you've got a, a river that's clearly full of industrial pollution. And you have Lean applying this sort of anti-romanticism to the whole scene. I mean, the whole scene is shot over their shoulders. They're stiffly posed, uh, especially Mill's performance as Mossop. And you, you've got the frothing river, which suggests that this is a pragmatic arrangement. As a matter of fact, you know, Mossop at this point is only willing to take it as a possible pragmatic arrangement, and he's not at all sold on the concept. And that the setting essentially isn't helping him. It's reinforcing Maggie's pragmatism, and he's a man of his time. He expected that there would be at least some emotion involved in any possible marriage. Makes no difference to me. Much better not upset him. I'm the judge. Also, he learned, Lean says that he learned this from Noel Coward. Noel Coward had told him, uh, especially when they're working on Brief Encounter, that you need to set love scenes against a dismal background. It created the irony and cut some of the sentimentality out of it. So it's something that he gained from uh, his experience with Brief Encounter, where you'll notice the love scenes in that film are also often set against industrial or dark areas or alleys and so forth. And so I, I think it works in that it cuts any sort of sentimentality that might have made the scene too um, triacly. Well, the other thing I think is, that besides the fact that this is a comedy, Lean reacted to some of the initial um, audience responses to Brief Encounter. He was very concerned about, even though this is a comedy, working against type, as you've just said. What he got when he went to screenings of Brief Encounter was people laughing at the very heavy-handed Rachmaninoff and, and the Tea Room Encounters. Brief Encounter breakthrough picture for Lean in terms of its success, in terms of the visual style that he imposes on that, in terms of what he does with the sort of ordinary character that Coward gave him in the one act still life, with Laura Jessup, in terms of what he creates, it, it's the archetype for all of the empowered heroines subsequent to her. Nonetheless, you've got a radically different approach here. I think the other thing that you have in taking the play what Lean has freely done is not really concerned himself about opening it up. It's not really about opening up a play. It's about focusing in on the characters that are most important. So that even though there are characters we don't see in the play here, Lean uses them to work what he wants in terms of the emotional interaction from Maggie and also, obviously, at this point, from Will Mossop. You have exaggerated performances much in the mode of the play, you know, a heavy set woman waving around a frying pan. And that lets Lean then bring in things in terms of the comic aspect that are not possible in the play. You're not going to have a parade in a play of uh, the Salvation Army walking past with a banner that says, beware the wrath to come. It's Lean working visual puns that aren't available to him in terms of stagecraft. It's also a little bit of a tribute to John Ford. Uh, one of the, Lean's great 
heroes in the cinema was John Ford, and they're playing We Shall Gather at the River, which is a, a constant in John Ford films. The other thing you have here, too, in, in terms of that, is using a lot of the straightforward staging that you have and shifting character types, much as Lean had learned from American movies and also from his work as an editor. That single POV shot brings him to the window so that even though you're on Will, you're now in his point of view. You are sharing with him, listening to this woman argue for him. You have the music swelling to externalize his growing sense of emotion. You have a visual push in onto his face. But then, of course, you're going to end it with a joke. His would-be mother-in-law's hand comes in and slaps him in the face. And that's the cut. Once again, Lean using his extensive experience as an editor to put images together to exaggerate the comic meaning and, of course, the emotional sentiment of his characters. Yeah, we should mention that, that Lean worked as an editor in the 30s, uh, often on these what were called quota quickies which was the British cinema attempt to have more British films made as more and more American films were being imported in order that the British cinema wouldn't collapse. So a certain percentage of the films had to be British. So they ended up being very cheaply made films. And, of course, he was involved in that. That's why the British cinema pre-war was in such doldrums, uh, except for people like Corda, uh, Corda's films, because it was forced into this quota quickie mode and was in the shadow of the American cinema. So, yes, his background as an editor plays very extensively in this film and does in all of his films, and that's part of the whole meticulous perfectionist quality that uh, people talk about. Again, here we have yet another scene reminiscent of a uh, Brief Encounter in that you're setting a love scene in front of an alley, you know, a sort of an alley with a, uh, a little bit of a, a dirty river running through it, and a forced perspective here of, of, the, of the light going up through the... It's a beautiful composition. This film was photographed by Jack Hilliard, we would also photograph Sound Barrier. And uh, it is a composition which is romantic. And when we, we talk about romanticism here, we're talking about English romanticism with a capital R rather than with a small r, meaning that it doesn't just have to do with love. It has to do with ideals and emotions and, and achieving ideals. And, and, and so this film is not just about the relationship between uh, the growing love relationship between Mossop and Maggie. It's about having an ideal and achieving it, her ideal of success and becoming a liberated woman projected onto him so that he then feels like he has strength and he's worth something in this world where he's been beaten down by Hobson, who spends most of the film beating down him or his daughters or whoever comes in his path. What's this with you and Willie? I'm going to marry him. Pass the tea, Alice. Well, I think he's Lean's established here, you know, uh, about a third of the way through the movie, that even though Hobson is the title character, it's really about Maggie and about Will as much. We've gone away from Hobson for a significant amount of narrative time. We've come back to him in a passive position, and, and we have Maggie essentially taking over a parental role as she's talking to her sisters. What's really, I think, significant is that now, from now on, in terms of the shift, Lean's going to continue this. You've got Hobson sort of coming in, trying to dominate it, and you've got Lean using the staging that lets the dominance break. You know, the two younger daughters are standing back, not doing anything, whereas Maggie, who clearly understands that most of her father is bluster and can be dealt with fairly easily, is first of all completely unconcerned about what he's saying. But then the other thing that's going to happen is going to have Lean bring her forward into the shot, where essentially she just brushes right past him physically as she's going to continue to do emotionally in terms of the narrative. Yeah, I think that also that, that Lawton's attempting in all of these scenes to establish uh, not only his dominance, but to establish that he has some worth, that he is not still the head of the family. And, and even in this composition, you see him trapped in between the two daughters and the third daughter on the right and left. Lean, of course, is famous for these sort of meticulous compositions, which we see in these scenes. And I think that no matter how much the Hobson character attempts to establish dominance, even in this composition right here, where he's his bulk is sort of dominating here, her, we, he immediately shifts and has her stand up so that she's equal to him. So all these things, you know, they th you may think that they're accidental. They're not. Lean's thought all this stuff out beforehand. As for me, I've given you the better part of 20 years' work without wages. 
Well, be, besides the fact that first she stands up and is equal, the scene continues and Hobson sits down so that she's behind him, towering over him. So yeah, exactly. You have Lean constantly restating in a way that's obviously impossible on stage, where there's no way to manipulate the perspective, what the audience has already come to appreciate. Because we've been with Maggie, um, not with Hobson, who's sort of been sleeping through those scenes. And now it's very clear that Maggie is the one that proposes taking her own life and doing with it what she will. Hobson, I think, is really the tragic figure here in the sense that he's incapable of dealing with the sort of social change that was taking place in the 1880s. And his continuous attempts to bluster his way through are never going to succeed uh, in the long run. There, this is uh, this scene is of course indicates the sadism of of the character of, of Hobson, the fact that he's going to beat this guy silly with his uh, belt, and uh, that Mossop is just this little rabbit character who runs in, goes back into his dark cellar, and uh, you know and really fears him. Uh, you know, it, again, Lawton was very effective at bringing forth the sort of sadistic character. Uh, you know, as far back as Doctor Moreau in the Island of the Lost Souls and and Nero in uh, Sign of the Cross, and that was an effective part of his character um, that he was able to project, as well as the masochistic side and things like Hunchback of Notre Dame. So in this whole sequence, what Lean does and what the play does to some degree, though it's not as extreme in the play, obviously, is that he takes the sim he's taking the sympathy away from Hobson more and more and putting it into the audience's sympathy into the uh, characters of Maggie and Willie. Because once he attempts to beat him, even though it's, it's unsuccessful, we're just losing more and more sympathy for him. And later on, more actions that occur that, that Hobson does, like it, almost calling his daughter a bitch in, the, in the, uh, the pub, takes away more and more sympathy from his character, so that his downfall, his eventual downfall, figuratively and literally, is, uh, this, is not uh, something that uh, we feel sorry for. We never feel sorry for him, actually, in the film. I think what we really can say is that in casting Lawton and accepting that casting, I think Lean committed uh, from that point on to using Lawton's larger-than-life persona uh, to giving you a version of Hobson that is somewhat different from the play, that, that has a tragic component. Um, you know, there's the buffoonish component, which is easy to get from Lawton, but when you shift it to a serious moment like this, you see the tragic component, a man that doesn't understand the consequences of his own actions, even when he has a character who works for him, uh, someone from whom he expects complete submission, defying him. And in a sense, this is the key to the film. Lawton precipitates and compels his failure to control Maggie and his other daughters uh, by letting himself go here. That, that is, I think, the only tragic component, really, that Lean instills into this comedy. I and mean, a lot of people criticized this movie because they said that Lean was not a, a comic director. I mean, he he, he rarely uh, went to that world again, and had only done it before with Blythe Spirit, the uh, the um, Noel Coward play. But um, the Pratt Falls, which we just saw, the the blustering of of Lawton, are all very appropriate for this play because this was part of the play, and also it's very much a music hall type of English music hall. Uh, uh, performance. And so, you know, falling down flat in your face is very much part of it. So the comedy he injected really would be hard to say that it's over the top. It's very in keeping with the spirit of the play and the spirit of English music hall and English comic theater of the time. And it's very similar to what was being done in other films of the time, like the Ealing Studios films, which are very successful comedies with people like um, Alec Guinness, Lady Killers, and so forth. Right. And ultimately created the British tradition uh, from which actors as diverse as Peter Ustinov and Peter Sellers emerged. Good morning, Miss Hobson. You're out early. Good morning, Mrs. Hepworth. Morning, Mum. Why, you're the man who made the boots. What I think we're saying about about the the adaptation of plays is that it's not a large part of Lean's work, but that what he does when he takes material, and 80% of the dialogue in this movie is taken from the play, is refocus it in terms of what it's saying and make it part of his own worldview. I think it's also interesting in the sense that Lean's early work was intricately entwined with Noel Coward. 
uh, co-directing in which we serve, and then with his partners at Cineguild, adapting three coward plays in succession, this happy breed, uh, followed by Blythe Spirit, uh, followed by Brief Encounter. In both this happy breed and Blythe Spirit, Lean was locked into this kind of drawing room world, if you will, especially because of the, the, the Technicolor, um, which did restrict him somewhat technically in terms of what he could do. But with Brief Encounter, you have Lean sort of breaking out and with here, you have Lean finally in a mature mode, not really concerning himself about setting, but refocusing on characters. And here and in his next and last adaptation of a play, which is Summer Madness, his next picture taken from Arthur Lorenz's Time of a Cuckoo, you have, I think, Lean giving you a fundamental understanding of how plays should be adapted. Lean didn't come out of theater. Uh, he didn't come out of directing actors on stage. As we've said, he came out of editorial. He came out of crafting performance from bits and pieces. But I think what he quickly learned as a director was that it's about using both. It's about sometimes letting the actors continue and give you a performance that's sustained over more than a few seconds of screen time. At other times, it's about focusing in at the key moments and picking those sections of a performance that are going to make the point dramatically in a way that's impossible on stage. This scene, uh, the setting here, reminds us very much of Madeline. Uh, in Madeline, there's a lot of cellar uh, rooms where you see the people's f uh, boots marching up and down over the, the window. And so this is sort of this dingy, a very uh, Victorian and, and Gothic uh, setting which the film has in contrast to its comic mode. And of course, they revitalize this and turn it into this very positive uh, boot shop in which, again, uh, the Willie Mossop character can gain a sense of his own worth. A lot of the film is, in fact, injecting him with a sense of worth because he has no sense of worth. And that last scene where he finally stood up to Hobson, you begin to see little bits of it. But even here, this constant tracking into his face is sort of wonderment on his face. Like, what is, what am I doing? What is this? This is a very nice montage sequence. Of course, again, we talk about Lean as an editor at the uh, Quota Quickies in the 30s. Um, this is part of the, what they learned. They're very influenced by Eisenstein and people like that. So we have this montage of them putting together this new shop, a mixture of comedy, but with, again, Malcolm Arnold's rush of this sort of 19th century romantic music. Right, and the other thing I think Lean does, even in a brief montage like that, is he again puts all the character emotions quickly in play in terms of thumbnails. You get that reaction shot of Willie as he watches the bed springs being tested, because the implication clearly here is that Will never been married before, never been with a woman in a bedroom before, and this is sort of embarrassing and disturbing to him. And then immediately you take him to a shot working the leather, checking out these things that he's buying where he's suddenly transformed into a very confident and determined man who knows what he's doing. And I think that's the arc we've been talking about, that Lean constantly does small versions of the overall arc of the picture with regards to all of the major characters, and there's three of them here. So that montage really helps suggest to the audience, yeah, Willie's going to be all right. Yeah, he's a little worried about the bed, but bottom line, he has something that he knows how to do, and that's work this leather and eventually he's going to get to the point in his life where he's comfortable with everything. Well, here we begin to see the downfall of uh, Hobson as he, he sees the brochures that have been put out for the new shop and, and his bragging and bravado now is beginning to get deflated as his friends see it too. And he sort of uh, stands around, uh, you know, embarrassed about it. Lean in, in uh, Kevin Brunlow's book talks about how uh, he basically watched Lawton's performance. He hardly directed it that he was just amazed and loved it and would just sit there and watch the performance and let him do what he wanted. And uh, that admiration carried over to some degree when he was asked uh, to do um, Bridge on the River Kwai to play the Al Ganez part originally and then ultimately refused because he didn't want to spend all that time in the jungle and then Alec Ganez was brought into the part. So Lean always admired him and talked about this performance being one of his favorites in his films. The brains around this table know there's more to setting up a business and handing around bits of paper. Aye. Aye. I think what, what Lean understood from the very beginning, from working with Coward, if you will, and, um, you know, he considered Noel Coward for, for Colonel Nicholson in Bridge on the River Kwai as well, is that when you're dealing with a character that's somewhat larger than life, as was Nicholson, as is Hobson, it makes it so much easier if you can get an actor 
that's at home with the part and simply let that performance run, it's hard enough to direct a movie without making added work for yourself. Lean is extremely underappreciated in terms of critical response to his work, but I don't think there's any question from the body of his work that he has had a tremendous influence on many other directors and has a body of work that is unsurpassed by any other directors in the history of cinema. That with a director of that stature, having this innate understanding of how you use actors, particular actors that are larger than life, how you don't spend a lot of energy on their performance and let you take time crafting and shaping the other performances, that's really what distinguishes a director like Lane, who can take a sort of ordinary project like this and craft it into a really extraordinary movie. Um, that's, I think, the thing for which Lean is least appreciated in terms of his career, which has very little to do until the end with anything resembling an epic. Well, good, good night, Maggie. It, it's been a grand day. and I, Yes, and of course his influence is great, as, uh, as uh, we just said. His influence on people like Scorsese and Kubrick and uh, Spielberg, they've all talked about how uh, when they made their epics that they, they looked back to Lean and admired his meticulousness and, and his devotion to, to performance and to, to actors and even his, his uh, sort of authoritarian way which he felt he needed in order to get the performances and the, the visuals he wanted. Um, here, the the relationship between um, Maggie and Will is growing. Even this is the they're becoming a sort of tenderness. She has this sort of motherly attitude towards him by this time, and again, it's like she's giving birth to this new man. And of course, this is a very lean scene. The rush of the you know nineteenth century romantic chords, the close up of the face, the ecstatic look that he's been through, not with just love, romance, small r, but with the romanticism of the 19th century of Shelley and Keats and Byron, this sort of something that Lean always went back to in his career, that that sort of 19th century romanticism. Right, but, but it's seamlessly done. I mean, you go from a shot of Maggie smiling to him coming and looking at the sign and Lean manipulating reality. I mean, maybe it's a gaslight we don't see turning up, but somehow a light hits the sign. And then you have that tight traveling shot of him at night with the music. And so like in three shots, Lean as we have said, constantly restates the character dynamic here and constantly makes sure that the audience knows where things are going and rides along with the character. It's an ability, I think, that it's not that it's rare in terms of directors, but it's rare in terms of bringing this level of craft to every scene in a way that Lean seldom failed to do. There's Fort, Mr. The ring. Got the top, Alice. I did with a brass ring. And this is, of course, a very symbolic scene in that this is the brass ring sequence where she chooses a brass ring to wear as her wedding ring and then at the end refuses to take it off when he offers her a better one when they have more money. And this symbolizes her practicality. So that the, the reason that, that, uh, that Maggie is more successful than other heroines of Lean, Laura Jessup or Matt Rosie Ryan or the Judy Davis character in Passage to India is because she has that practical edge. Those, those characters, the other ones, are true 19th century romantics with no practicality at all. But Maggie is very practical, and that ring represents that. She, she can run this business. She can make it a success while her father's business, as we see here, is beginning to go downhill um, because her sisters are not as capable of uh, running the business as she was. Well, I think what you know we've been saying about Lean's heroines is that Maggie does stand out from them. Lean's work could be, you know, simply divided in terms of the influence of 19th century British literature and not just 19th but early 20th century British literature into using a lot of the character types that were established in Thomas Hardy for his heroines and a lot of the character types established in Joseph Conrad's work for his heroes. Clearly what's at work here isn't terribly Hardy-esque in terms of Maggie. She's the one that sort of breaks that. Some of that comes from the original play, but I think a lot of it comes from Lean understanding that unlike Laura Jessup, who precedes her, unlike Jane Hudson, who's going to follow her, and unlike Rosie Ryan, which is the sort of clearest expression of what happens to a Hardy-esque heroine when, when, when she confronts the fact that life isn't as romantic as she would like to believe, you have what we've been saying, this extreme pragmatism, 
that actually permits a certain romanticism to be injected into the end. We've already seen it with Maggie sort of smiling at Will. So that by the end, as Will is transformed, you have her beginning to think, well, maybe you don't need me anymore. Um, there's an explicit scene in the play that Lean places very critically in the movie uh, when Will goes and does something on his own, and it shocks Maggie, even though up to that point she's sort of been unshockable. And I think clearly, in terms of that, Lean's timing in, in Hobson, it, it's not about getting laughs, it's about really getting people to ride along and empathize with the characters, and that's what ultimately makes for a successful movie, comic or dramatic. And that's what's in play here, as, as I've said, not just in every scene, but I think in every transition and in every reshaping of the play. And I shall not be back till late tonight. We've mentioned uh, the fact that Lawton was a sort of diva in his performances, but we should also say that he's a very sensitive artist, an excellent director on his own of theater, and then of one of the greatest films of the 1950s, Night of the Hunter, uh, which he did with Robert Mitchum. And, and so he, he always had this very sensitive soul, which I think was why Lean had such great empathy with him, as he did with Noel Coward, because he saw that sensitivity. And here we have the a wind is always an important motif in, in Lean's films, growing again out of 19th century poetry. The fact that the wind represents some sort of inspiration or change occurring in the character. And of course, here we're beginning to see the complete dissolution of of Hobson as the inspiration which his daughter and her fiance have is destroying him because he can't face it. And so he's becoming this just total drunk. You know, he was always an alcoholic, but now he's just becoming, he's going to end up with the DTs in a, in a few scenes later. And he's become the laughing stock of his friends in the pub. <laughs> Vicky doesn't need a bustle for that. <laughs> My friend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's two things happening in, in the scene. First off, you've got Hobson in a context that we never see in the play. And the play never goes to Moonrakers. Um, you see some of the after effects of his visits. But in, in fact, um, there's very little explicit drunkenness in the play. There's more sort of after effects, uh, hangover. What you have here in Lawton's performance is, again, Lean sort of letting it ride. But again, Hobson sort of expressing his own tragic circumstances. You know, he does see himself as a big fish in a small pond, as you said earlier. But here, he's forced to confront it. I mean, there's a clarity that comes, if you will, from the overconsumption of alcohol, where he sees his so-called friends for what they are. And he sees himself, at least subconsciously, as a tragic character. Uh, brought down by these small people who have kept him from great things. It's a pompous mock tragedy, but it's really the tragedy of the film nonetheless. Yeah, and, and here we have the first example of truth-telling, where actually he begins to see the people, as you said, as they, they really are, his cronies, and, and, and even his own uh, bravado and his own foolishness. And of course, now we have what we've talked about before is the subjectification that Lean so favors in his movies, where he shifts into from the third person into the first person, where suddenly you're beginning to see the film as one character sees it. And here, it, through the optical effects, we begin to see the beginning of a dissolution of his brain through the being alcohol-soaked. And uh, this whole sequence, which carries over, is, is complete sub subjectification. And, and it's one of the scenes that was liked by critics. Poor old Denton hasn't had right change for 20 years. You should also mention that Lean was very sensitive to criticism and partially growing out of his background from a very strict Quaker family who refused to let him see movies until he was a teenager. And a lot of it has to do with his relationship with his father, uh, who he was very critical of him. And so criticism hurt him badly. And of course, we have the important event in 1970 when he was ambushed by the National Society of Film Critics under Pauline Kael and they bashed him for Ryan's daughter and he stayed away from filmmaking for over a decade. Even though he was involved in projects, it was an extremely traumatic event for him. I think what we've been saying about Lean in, in, in terms of his... Um, Confidence as a director is that Lean understood what could be accomplished uh, on the surface in a movie, and he also understood the subtext. 
that he could put into it. So the subtext you have in those points of view in the pub are again part of Hobson's tragedy. And the subtext here is, is, is even more explicit. You've got this moment of direct lunacy, uh, the fascination with the moon and the water. And here you have in this really remarkable shot the complete equation of Hobson with the moon, you know, where his face comes into focus exactly where the moon was. And the befuddlement that he gets from Lawton, again, by selecting moments, is very telling here. You've got a character living in a social order that's in complete transition, trying to fall back on the natural order that we've spoken of, you know, looking for some sort of consistency and some validation of his world and, and not finding it at all. And yeah, it, it's expressively a remarkable sequence, but more important, in character terms, it's sort of the most tragic moment for Hobson as a character, and it will precipitate in a way that's not in the play um, the possibility for, for Maggie to finally irrevocably have her way and help her sisters. What happens at the end of the sequence is a key to the play, but obviously we don't see it happen in the play. We don't see any of this, which is completely invented for the movie. Also, there's, it's sort of a send-up, as we've mentioned before, of his, his more romantic uh, films in that the moon is a, an important symbol in 19th century romanticism, and here it's played for laughs. The same thing with the look of this sequence. It's a beautiful sequence with the wet streets and very much like Great Expectations or Oliver Twist, and yet it's played again for, for satire. Um, and, and, of course, Lawton plays it again like a music hall star. You know, very wide, very broad, very slapstick, very, very, there's just about to be a pratfall here. And so, you know, it's, it's very much in that theatrical tradition, which Lean was faithful to and which uh, Lawton is faithful to. Well, and it's taking that theatrical tradition and sort of creating this parodies and visual puns that you have the ultimate here, which is created by a mat shot, you know, an actual special effect, the enhanced fall and the character careening in the foreground superimposed over something, a key event in the play that can't be seen there and that obviously is, is very expressively included here. By the way, that wasn't a theremin in that scene. That was an actual saw played by a Belgian master of it that, that Malcolm Arnold found, and uh, it wasn't the Nicholas Rocha uh, theremin from Spellbound. Well, I think Lean, even though he had worked with four different composers before Arnold, first with Arnold and then with Maurice Jarre, when he finally found a composer that could give him what he wanted, um, it helped him a lot in terms of how he shaped the emotional content of various scenes. Lean was extremely conscious of this, said so in a number of interviews about the importance of music, but in terms of what you brought up earlier and what he learned from Noel Coward, he also would occasionally use music as counterpoint um, to what was going on visually, would put romantic music over a heavy scene, would put a sort of heavy effect music like the tremolo over a comic scene and discovered, I think, early on that you can use contrapuntal underscore uh, to help with the effect. It's like the oral equivalent of putting that romantic scene next to the polluted River Irwell. Yeah, and, and, and the music is really a character in this film. I mean, it's really a character. Uh, Malcolm Arnold, there's so many cues, whether it's comic or mysterious, like the saw, or whatever, it's very heavily cued. And Malcolm Arnold was, had a very strong sense of that. And of course, then he worked on Bridge on the River Kwai and he received an Academy Award for that. But I mean, he has a very extensive, he's written hundreds of ballets and operas and symphonies. He was originally in the BBC Orchestra and after the war became a prestigious uh, composer. And he was also very influenced by jazz. And so you see the experimental elements of this film. And, and ironically also was the son of a shoemaker, which uh, I don't know if that played into, into the theme of this film at all. I don't know if it really influenced the music, but certainly it maybe gave it a little additional gusto to the shoe ballet that opens it. I think what we have with Malcolm Arnold is a tendency towards sort of florid music in the tradition we've been talking of, music hall. We have Lean taking advantage of that specific talent and using it to great effect here in Nkwai. And, and then when he discovered uh, Jar, um, 
using it again. I mean, a different composer with slightly different tendencies, but again, using it in a very explicit and effective way. I think arguably, along with his other talents, uh, Lean's use of music in motion pictures may be responding to the sort of um, mockery that was uh, critically given to the Rachmaninoff in Brief Encounter throughout the rest of his career made a very explicit and I think repeatedly self-conscious decision uh, to go for specific types of music and to be very, very careful with how he scored all of his movies, comic and dramatic, you know, small and epic. The scene that was just before this, we saw the composition of the semi, the circle around Mossop as, as she's telling them that they have to be respectful to him and, and he's part of the family now, which represents the family circle, so it's very much a symbolism. And now we have again the, the industrial background, which is a, a backdrop, and uh, again against a love scene where uh, flowers become significant. Flowers are also another important symbol in Lean's films. Uh, in in Chivago, of course, the sunflowers and uh, Ryan's daughter, the use of flowers constantly uh, pressed into books. Or, and, and this is something that, uh, again, he draws from 19th century romanticism. And setting that against the industrial background, again, creates that same irony or counterpoint to the love scene. What you have in, a, in an ordinary comic sequence like this, two things. First, obviously, there's a level of invention here in terms of the movie. None of this actually happens in the stage play. The aftermath is very important. But as he has, say, previously with the business card using an insert, you could see it was upside down. The use of the pocket watch here in a very cinematic way makes a point. And then climbing up the steps in this comic sequence where you have Lawton sort of looking around furtively, at the same point on the pullback, you now have Lean creating a sort of figurative link back to Will Mossop. You've got Hobson climbing out of a cellar much the way you had Will climbing out of a cellar. And you've got Lean reinforcing a character situation where Hobson is now at his lowest ebb and has been reduced to the status of someone like Will at the beginning of the movie. This event also gives Maggie as a character something which Madeline never had. In fact, what's key to Madeline, which is Lean's darkest picture in many ways, is the fact that women have only two options in terms of Victorian society, if you will, uh, marriage uh, or spinsterhood. And often women who are conflicted in terms of what society is saying to them um, go to extremes. Maggie goes to an extreme that's socially acceptable. Uh, killing your lover, as Madeline purportedly does in that movie, isn't socially acceptable. But I think Lean's ability to infuse both those characters with the same proto-feminist outlook is what's key to creating a consistent worldview and to, and to commenting in an ongoing way where we talked about the English romantic tradition. No, I've gotten that wrong road round. Expressed by Mr. Prosser and... We also see here where he's finally gaining his real strength, where she's coached him. You can tell by the smile on her face and the way he says the lines. In many ways, she's stage managing or directing his performance, which is a sort of funny commentary, ironic commentary on Lean himself, because in many ways, Brenda DeBanzi's character is directing John Mills' character, at least in, in terms of the play itself or the, the film itself. And so she's given him these lines to say, rehearsed him, and now he's going to prove himself as the man of the house, in quotes, even though, in fact, she's the man of the house in reality. There's a couple character actors in here that are mildly important. Albert Prosser, who's the, the lawyer, is played by Richard Wattis, who's famous for playing these sort of snooty, oh, fishes characters, and uh, especially in films like Bells of the St. Trinians with Alistair Sim, and in lots of TV shows, again, hundreds of TV shows, including Disneyland in, in, uh, on American TV. And then, of course, uh, Derek Blumfield, who, who's playing Freddie Beanstalk, the other fiancé, um, who was playing also on television leading men and uh, usually handsome leading men, but died fairly young. 
1964 at the age of 44. But again, they're all fine character British, British theater and television actors. There's a, an interesting shift that Lean makes here in terms of the play. In the play, there's a tangential and really not very important discussion between Prosser and Beanstalk about whether they're going to help wash the dishes. Something that's really not important in terms of the dynamic here, and I think we've got a basically very clear example of how Lean can take a play and its sort of dramatic pluses and minuses and discard what he doesn't need. So that all of that stuff is gone. All of the setup of them going to the bedroom, which goes on some length in the play, is quickly and elegantly resolved. And more importantly, I think you have your very significant staging. You've got Hobson in the doorway. You can't see him. All you can see is his hands and his belt until finally it's Will Mossop who, because Maggie insists, says, okay, he can come in. So you have him in an immediate diminished capacity, sort of hunkered down, watching out for the things that are on the ceiling of the cellar. And you have him not just because he's taken that fall, um, both literally and figuratively, a couple of scenes before. You have him here now, I think, in the post-tragic circumstance of trying to resolve his life and resolve an issue. And as vulnerable as he will be anywhere in this movie. And also, we have here the first of the Hobson's choices. Hobson's choice means something like take it or leave it. You know, you're given a choice, but you're not really given a choice. And this is the first of the Hobson's choices he's faced with, and then again another one at the end of the movie. By now, he's fallen completely. I mean, he even has very little bluster yet. I mean, she forces him to eat cake. You know, it's like the power is completely shifted now. I mean, it's just he doesn't want to eat it, but he'll, you know, stuff it down his face because... He realizes he has no choice anymore. He's, he's lost. I mean, without them, he's really lost. He's going to be sued. He's going to be disgraced among his friends and in the newspapers, as he discusses. And, of course, this is a very rubbery Charles Lawton face, which you see and which he's able to use as expressions to alter his whole physical appearance and his whole mien. And you have Lean uh, imposing, if you will, this focus uh, that's not possible in the play. I mean, this scene is taken pretty directly from the play. But Lean's going to play it all in medium close shots for quite a while and use the focus in on the characters to create, I think, a certain empathy in Mossop. Not only is Hobson his old master, but he is a man afterwards fallen on poor circumstances. And I think you've got a subtle indication there from Mills' performance that Mossop has, even though he's going to conform to what Maggie wants, a fundamental understanding of Hobson. What I think you have here is Mossop understanding that even if he's going to own his own shop and have his own family, he doesn't really want to become Hobson. He doesn't want to fall into this trap that society puts out for men and women from the 1800s well into the 20th century. Yeah, and, and also we begin to see he does have an empathy for him uh, because he sees that he could turn into that kind of a character. I think that there is also just a matter of uh, he's known him for so many years, he worked for him, and he doesn't want to see him fall into into it's a sort of dire straits that he's fallen into. And also the, the Lawton character, the Hobson character, can uh, is very effective at making his emotional appeal. I mean, he's a, you know, he's a liar to some degree. I mean, he's a performer in the film itself. He performs for his friends at the pub. He's now performing for them. I mean, the actor is acting, you know, here, and he's playing the actor. For it. My word, and that's somewhat like a squeeze and all. I can see it's serious. Well, this is something I think that we don't have in the play that Lean and his fellow filmmakers, primarily the performers, are managed to distill. The other thing that's interesting about the staging here is that Lean seldom uses a sort of invisible editing scheme that you find at large in a lot of American pictures of the 30s, say most notably Frank Capra, uh, where you cheat in terms of character positions. But here is probably the only time in this movie that Lean is going to do that um, there's a two-shot of Will and Maggie, and essentially the dynamic here is two against one, 
a uh, fairly common dynamic. But the other thing that he's going to do to sort of suggest this vacillation is go into this shot. It, it doesn't really make sense because Maggie should be in the corner of it. But nonetheless, he's going to go into the single of Will Mossop where he's acting determined, where he's sort of matching Hobson performance for performance. Tells, to hear you talk, it sounds like a pleasure to you. Nay, it's not. In mentioning the newspapers and mentioning the Manchester newspapers that are going to cover his downfall, it's almost like he's the thought has come to him right then. And he's sort of like, oh, that's, that's, that's terrible, you know. So, again, you're not sure whether Maggie has prompted him to say this or whether it's out of his own shock that, 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 that this guy has fallen so far and could fall farther. I think what's interesting here in that the dialogue is mostly from the play and the sequence is Lean letting the performers determine a sort of mode and putting them together in a very cinematic way. It's not that the scene would necessarily play different if you had a three-shot of all of the characters, but I think you've got dynamic moments like Hobson standing and a cut to Massa recoiling. And then they come back in from the edges of the frame so that you have, at, at its loosest, a three-shot here but really a very elaborate and very controlled dynamic between the characters, mostly two against one, but occasionally that cheat so that it's one against one, with Lean saying, you know, there's, there's a, a key moment here. And I think what the key is, it's the transition, if you will, from Hobson's sort of self-contained mode, because for all of his bluster, he does see himself as a self-sufficient man and a sort of transference that's going to take place with Will. This is his wedding night, about which he's somewhat nervous. And after he faces down his father-in-law, it's going to give him a sort of different emotional situation in terms of the wedding night. And it's, it's a dynamic that's really not in the play. But Lean takes it from the performances that he gets from Mills and Lawton and puts it out there subtly for the audience so that it colors this scene and the scenes that are going to follow immediately. It's also scenes like this that actually made British film so unpopular in the United States. Um, they had such a difficult time penetrating the American market because uh, British audiences were much more attuned to theater and literature, and so they could stand scenes that lasted this long and are basically sort of performance-driven, but they're also sort of plot-driven. You know, we have to figure out what's going to be the twist and turn here so that the Hobson's choice can occur and they can trap him and, you know, he he gives them the dowry money not knowing what he's saying. And all This is sort of like twists that take a long time. And so that's, you know, the British cinema always had a difficult time penetrating this American market because of scenes like this. And, and Lean, of course, always tried to visualize it better and so and to make it um, more of a visual experience, and as he does with these compositions. This is a wonderful composition with um, Maggie, again, stage managing, looking very sly and in the background, all in white where everyone else is in black. And it's very obvious that she's the director of this whole thing. She's come up with this plan, and she's waiting for it to pop. Right, and I mean, you, you essentially have a long take here, but you had a push-in in the middle where you, you went in even tighter to this dynamic triangular shot with, as you said, Maggie in the center. And if you look down at Will, Mills was going back and forth slightly befuddled, looking both at Prosser and Hobson. You've got, I think, unfortunately, what you've said is correct. Uh, a lot of American audiences simply couldn't appreciate a scene like this. I think what helps, obviously, in terms of a movie like this, in any audience, is Lean's careful and very specific staging so that you have sustained shots and a sort of tension building up with an occasional cut when there's a revelation. The lean doesn't give way, if you will, to the montage until there's a reason. When finally Hobson sort of understands what's going on, we go into single shots and this altering dynamic. But as you've said, initially Maggie is right there at center and now she's moved over and is carefully listening, and now redirects the play, if you will, by indicating that the amounts are too much. Yeah, it's very much like she's a stage manager, as I've said before. It's just she brings in the different actors. It's like she brings them into the different scene, gradually bringing the men first and the women first, and now he's completely just overwhelmed. He's been so 
she so conquered him. There's still yet another reversal to occur, but it's the first reversal of fortune, which then establishes the dynamic of her power over him, and that, in fact, she has conquered him and uh, eventually will completely, in many ways, control him by the end of the, by the, end of the movie. I think what we're saying is that there are certain aspects to these characters that are embedded in the play, but in terms of the visual dynamism that we've seen at work, you have Lean taking what he learned as a cutter, taking this concept of putting images together and applying them to performance in a way that colors the performance, but also reinforces the dynamic that's inherently there. There's a clear correlation for Lean between Maggie's position as a stage manager in the play and Maggie's position as a stage manager in terms of his visual scheme. So that when you have that shot that we just talked about, the push into her underlines the visual dominance that she has and also reinforces the character dominance that she has from the play as its stage manager. We should also mention that Lawton's performances were drawn very intensely from his own sort of method that he developed himself. And, and a part of the reason that he was difficult to work with was because he demanded such intensity and sort of internal discipline. And then uh, that often rubbed other actors the wrong way. And part of the conflict with Brendan DeBanzi was probably out of that sort of uh, powerful characters, powerful actors playing strong characters and then rubbing off, rubbing uh, against each other, not only in terms of performance, but in terms of their personalities. And then since Leans tended to side with Lawton because he admired him so much, uh, Brendan DeBanzi often felt that she was singled out, uh, which Brunlow mentions occurred somewhat in Passionate Friends too, where he, he aligned himself with a male character and Ann Todd, his wife at the time, was felt that she was isolated from their sort of relationship. A bit of company. Do you want company on your wedding night? Well, I've not been married before. Well, Lean's talked a lot of times about his tactical approach to getting a performance. I think the phrase that he often used was that he'd like to see what the actor had to offer and then sort of tickle it to get it enhanced. What I think is very clear is that Lean, in getting a performance from an actor initially, uh, would probably tend to be a little bit more overbearing with the women. Um, unfortunately, with someone like Ann Todd and previously Kay Walsh, he was on the job being overbearing with someone who was his wife in private life. And uh, Lean's success as a husband, um, I don't think we could say that it was great given the number of times that he was married and the number of marriages that dissolved. Clearly, his professional relationships with actors, though, a key to getting the kinds of results that we see in Hobson's and in all of his really extraordinary movies. And I have to think that much as we talked about John Ford, who would go to extreme and often cruel lengths to get a performance from an actor, for Lean, I think, to get this sort of indignant response from his proto-feminist female characters, I think the easiest way to get that is to sort of treat them um, with a characteristic disdain. And I, I do think here, obviously, whatever tactic he brought to bear in terms of Brenda DeBanzi worked. Got a performance from her. That's the core of the movie. This is a wonderful sequence we're about to get into. This is extended from the play. The play, it's a very short sequence, this wedding night jitters sequence. But here, Lean has extended it. And in very much it foreshadows the scene in Ryan's Daughter between Rosie Ryan and the Robert Mitchum character. This has a much more successful uh, sexually and romantically, the outcome is much more successful uh, than Ryan's Daughter. But it has the same sort of dynamic at play here. Also, again, we have the flowers, which are important as a symbol, and, and also indicating not only in Lean's films, but also in her character, because it shows that there is this sentimental strain to it. And uh, also the role reversal, which appears throughout this whole film, where the fact that the John Mills character is very, plays more of the traditional female role, and in many ways is the Rosie Ryan character, because he's the one with the jitters the night before, while she's much more secure and, and matter of fact about it, and, uh, you know, tells him to finish up his work and then, then come to bed and, 
Lean was sometimes criticized by some of the critics for extending this sequence so far beyond what it should have been, but it's a very comic scene and works really well, and also plays up this whole role reversal uh, of the traditional roles of male and female in this sequence. I think what you said about the play, much of the reluctance of Will to be alone with Maggie on the first night is in conversations with Prosser and Beanstalk, which are briefly included here. But really what Lean's doing visually here in an extended shot is forcing you to sort of empathize with the discomfort of Will Mossop, letting as he has with many of the other performances, letting it play. And so finally when he cuts, you have an over-the-shoulder shot that reinforces very succinctly in terms of her shadow moving back and forth under the door and in a way that's really, I think, remarkably visual. Again, a, an example of Lean understanding how to establish a sort of character emotion and how to compel the viewer to participate with it in a sense that's inherently cinematic and well beyond what he was given in the play. Well, again, it, as we said before, it subjectifies the scene because now you're in the position of Willie Mossop. You begin to understand his his fear. He's obviously a virgin. That's the implication here. And that he doesn't know what to expect from this. And so it's all played, again, for comedy. The music drops off for a while, then comes back. And then when she finally tells him to come in, I mean, he only comes in when she sort of orders him in. Uh, it has this wonderful march music, which uh, Malcolm Arnold uses to indicate that he's sort of walking off to his fate, you know. And, of course, in this case, it's a much more pleasant fate than uh, Rosie Ryan has in uh, her wedding night and, and uh, Ryan's daughter. I think what really is going on here in terms of the extended sequence which perhaps in terms of modern filmic construction might go on a little bit too long, it nonetheless lean taking the time to set something up. And while it's humorous, it's also a sort of explicit turn for Will's character. I mean, he's dominated his father-in-law. He's participated in the humiliation of this older man who was, as he often says, the old master, the man who taught him a trade and provided the circumstances for his success as a bootmaker. Now you have him undergoing an emotionally traumatic situation and Lean stays on it for a long time. The music reinforces it. Other things happen. Finally, this sort of embarrassing moment with her opening the door and saying, I'm ready. And the question for Will is, is he? Nonetheless, because he understands the, the circumstances which have brought him here, I think, yeah, you finally have Lean stating in an explicit way, yeah, he's ready. You know, um, he's going to pick up his clothes, he's going to take everything in, and he's going to march into the bedroom in a way which says to the viewer, what's going to go on there is not going to be something unsuccessful or disappointing as it will be in Ryan's daughter. We're in a different perspective. It's going to be something positive and an affirmation. It's going to be, in a comic context, what the viewer should expect. And again, this, as we've mentioned, the March music, Malcolm Arnold, always, as I said, the music is really a character. And in here, it, it tells you what uh, emotions to, to feel and, and also gives you the sort of comic cue as to this sort of, again, this march into the bedroom. Well, in, in an explicit sort of way, what Lean does with all of the comic moments here, he's used the music, used the performance to milk them. Um, perhaps, as I said a moment ago, he, he milks them a little bit more than one would in a 21st century motion picture. Nonetheless, certainly in 1954, it worked fine. And everything that's transpired in the last few minutes has been dependent on Maggie, if you will, but she hasn't even been seen. It's been a shadow and an off-camera voice. And so you've got holding the shot, as Lean loved to do, the light goes out, and whatever transpires behind the doors, we're not sure of yet. But it's hinted at by the music, because there's this, again, crescendo, 19th century 
romantic music on, on the track. A- absolutely, as we pull back into this sort of forlorn cellar, and then yeah, uh, you know, you go back to what seems like every day, the dawn, a little moment of suspense, but clearly from from the initial moment even though everything's back to what seemed to be normal, as soon as we come off Maggie and pan back, there's a clear affirmation of the fact that, yeah, hey, it went okay. And now Will is ready to commit himself to a full and complete marriage, uh, both in terms of emotional fulfillment and in terms of fiscal fulfillment that they work together and are married. You love your breakfast as soon as it's made. John, we should mention that John Mills was uh, had fallen on sort of hard times by this film. Uh, he was financially and also in terms of getting parts was uh, having a little bit of trouble. He was aging, and he, as we said, had been playing um, uh, sort of these every young everyman characters before. And uh, it's sort of this film sort of transitions him in a way into more character type parts. Not that he didn't play leading men after this. But he started to move more into character type parts. As in Tunes of Glory, one of his more successful films in the United States, he played a military martinet. So he, he began to transition more as, as far as this film into different types of roles. It's interesting in that Lean's career as a director obviously permits him to work with actors at various stages of their career and get very different results. So yeah, Mills is a perfect example, you know, playing a, an adolescent sailor in In Which We Serve, playing this sort of middle range, and then um, coming back to Ryan's daughter, playing the, the very disturbed and pathetic character, uh, Michael, the, the role that won him a Sporting Actor Academy Award. That's sort of Lean's career arc. Um, we mentioned Tunes of Glory, which is directed by Lean's former partner, Ronald Neem, who went on to a fairly successful career himself as a director, but for a lot of his early life was overshadowed by Lean. And what's interesting about Hobson and Sound Barrier, you know, they're sort of the, the transitional pictures for Lean. Uh, as we've mentioned, he started with Noel Coward at Cine Guild, where he's partnered with Ronald Neem and Anthony Havelock Allen. And he associated again with Havelock Allen on Ryan's Daughter. But essentially, there was a rupture and the dissolution of Cine Guild, uh, a lot of it revolving around conflicts with Neem on Passionate Friends, that changed the course of Lean's career. Uh, Sound Barrier in this movie, I think, established him um, – as a successful filmmaker, not dependent upon equal partners. Uh, this is the second picture that he has both produced and directed. And this is the picture that will springboard um, his career into the epic and international context for which he's best known. And also, it's the last of his really indigenous sort of English films. All the films before this are very, very English films. And uh, this is the last of that, the last of the black and white. And once we move into Summertime or Summer Madness in the next film with Catherine Hepburn, also produced by Corda, we move into his more international color and then on some scales more epic films. And that's a big change from this film. So this is the end of his English period, really. And, of course, he, along with Carol Reed, and Powell Pressburger were the people who revitalized the British cinema after the war. A lot of it due to Corda. Corda gave Michael Powell his, really his start in, in directing films, or at least restarted his career. Uh, he gave Lean uh, you know, breaks in the 50s with Breaking the Sound Barrier in this film, and of course is responsible for Carol Reed's uh, among his best films in the 40s, including The Third Man. So Corda is a lot of the responsible for this revitalization of the British cinema after the Second World War, and of which Lean was very much a part of. And so this is the end of his sort of his, his farewell to that, those people in that period and, and on to a new era for, for David Lean. Well, ironically, I mean, all of his pictures up to this point have been British companies uh, and... British actors, uh, from Noel Coward through Lawton, who was an international actor, but nonetheless British, 
And starting with Catherine Hepburn in Summer Madness, following uh, with William Holden in in Kwai, um, he's going to move into a, a different context in terms of actors and in terms of locations. So yeah, as we've said, it's, it's his last British period film, his last black and white film. But I think the thing that we've hopefully indicated is that the technique that's at work here um, is the same technique that he's going to apply to his best known pictures, the series that he did from Kwai, Lawrence, and Jivago. And in this, of course, we see that technique, the subjectification. This is one of the most famous sequences where he's, he his DTs, where we've known he's fallen completely into alcoholism, which the doctor tells him shortly. But the rat up here on the on the bedstead, the uh, the insects, and then seeing himself as another person in the mirror, again, we become the character. We can empathize with him because we are now seeing things the way he sees them. And uh, um, this is the doctor played by John Laurie. He was a famous... A uh, Shakespearean actor worked with uh, Olivier a lot on the films like Hamlet and also uh, worked with the British American productions uh, for Disney of Kidnapped uh, in Treasure Island and, uh, and, and is a very famous theatrical Scottish actor. Do you have a requirement to tell you the cause, Mr. Hobson? I'm paying the brass to tell me. Well, I think what we've been saying about the subjectification is that it, it has shifted considerably in the course of the film and been refocused within sequences. When we come back to Hobson here, after his sort of tragic fall, uh, I think it's a possibility that's redemptive is introduced by Lean here. And that's not really in the play, even though Hobson comes to reconcile himself to his daughters and to Will Mossop, mostly because I think you have Lawton's presence and his performance here in a very passive position I mean, Lean permits Lawton's character to continue to sort of dominate the frame, even though he's lying down in the foreground, so that when he finally gets up and states his mind in terms of what the doctor has said to him, I think you're going to have a sort of, um, for want of something better, resurrection of Hobson in a slightly different mode, so that the redemptive possibilities in the character are important to Lean. They're important because, first of all, in a comic context, there's no reason to completely disparage a figure like Hobson. They're also important because of what we talked about, the mirror between Hobson and Will and his daughter, how they're all sort of meshed together in terms of working through issues in a society that was basically repressive. We mentioned before that Lawton almost left the film, tried to get out of the film when Robert Donut was not insured for the film and, and, and was not able to play the part of Willie Mossop. And we didn't mention how Corda, according to Kevin Brunlow and other sources, Corda forced him back into the film by threatening to reveal his homosexuality, which at that time was illegal in, in England. And Lawton was not as well known publicly as a homosexual as someone like Noel Coward was. And so it was a significant enough threat, according to Elsa Lancaster's wife in her autobiography, to keep uh, Lawton in line. So we see these two sides of Corda really. The the court of the creative man who loves starting the careers or helping the careers of men like David Lean or Carol Reed or Michael Powell, but also the the ruthless producer, uh, which many attest to, um, willing to use any method um, to keep people in line, to make the production go, to, to finish the film. Well, I think the problem that Corda and same thing happened at Rank and at the smaller studios faced is in a post-war environment trying to make a motion picture for the cost that had increased after the war and to recoup from the domestic market was becoming impossible. So that a lot of the decisions they made uh, painted them into corners. I mean, for Corda, sort of abandoning this picture wasn't an option. Whereas before the war, a lot of projects started and fell apart. Lean's experience with Neem and Havelock Allen, Cinegild, working through rank, there are a lot of projects in which they spent some time and some money that ultimately didn't come together and were simply dropped without great problems. By this time in the mid-50s, um, having invested in a project to a certain extent, dropping it uh, presented a great fiscal problem for uh, studio heads like Corda. 
The same was being experienced, obviously, in the United States in terms of the, the studio system as it is known today being very different from the studio system in the early 50s and the transition to sort of the modern studio era uh, starting to take place. It, it was much more critical for uh, someone like Corda, though, who could not afford a single misstep. We're moving into the, what is the, really the final victory and the final Hobson's choice here, where she's going to gain complete control and dominance of her father, but in, in a sympathetic way, because she is really the only daughter who's willing to take care of him, uh, even though she gains an advantage not only um, emotionally but uh, financially from what she does at the end. Um, but we see that side of her character, which is little Kiss talks about too, she's sort of softening to a degree because... She's succeeded in what she's doing, and she's actually fallen in love with the, the man that she originally really just wanted to use as a, as a stalking horse. I think the other thing that's interesting here is that socially, I mean, what's happening is an intervention. Um, she's coming back. There go the, all the bottles out into the street. And that's somewhat shocking to the other daughters who were mortified to have their father's alcoholism exposed. Again, Lean bringing to bear quite easily the fact that Maggie, in her proto-feminist point of view, understands that, you know, what's the point of hiding something that everyone knows anyway? She says it explicitly. Let's just get on pragmatically with what we need to do here to save our father's life. The doctor says he's going to die unless he changes the way he behaves. Let's come together as a family and intervene. Well, it increases the, the audience's uh, admiration for her because now the two daughters are going to be shown to be sort of spoiled, snooty, snobbish uh, females who've married into wealth, or at least middle class, with the lawyer and the uh, shopkeeper, and now really don't have much interest in their father except possibly that they could inherit a business, which is what they fear here, that they won't inherit this business, that in fact the Will Mossop is now going to take control of it, which is part of his plan and, 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 uh, and Maggie's plan. And so they shift because we're losing sympathy totally for the two sisters. The sh the, the, our sympathy is becoming intensified for Maggie and for Will. I think we've got the kind of a character transition that takes place in a lot of lean films. Clearly, Will now is, looks radically different. He's got a suit that fits. He doesn't have that uh, bowl over the top of the head haircut anymore. His hair has grown out. He looks like an ordinary tradesman. Um, we first saw him coming out of that hole like a rabbit with his hair tousled. We now see him on top of a ladder looking like a gentleman that's in control and, and telling these two women whom he used to address as Miss Vicky and Miss Alice, um, not only is he now their equals, but in many ways he's their superior. He's standing up on a ladder, not coming up out of a cellar. And this is a fulfillment of the, sort of the visual transition that we've seen at work. Uh, clearly, when Hobson climbed out of the cellar after the precipitous event that led incontrovertibly to his downfall, coming up there and seeing the shoes of the process server. We had the equation of Hobson with Will's original position, and now we've seen Will in an elevated position, which we've never seen Hobson in his own shop. You've got, again, a visual dynamic here that clearly anticipates what's going to go on. These women have been revealed as, you know, they're venal, they're ordinary, self-centered young women. They are not really capable of the generosity of spirit that really underlies Maggie. Right, but always tempered with a certain um, practicality. Maggie does it because there is some degree of love for her father and compassion, but she does it largely because she knows that she can take over his shop too and expand and then maybe even move on to a, a more expensive shop. Um, now that uh, Hobson's shop has fallen onto hard times, it makes it an easier way. And of course, we in, in Mills' performance changes radically too. He, not only in the way he looks, but also he doesn't have that deer in the headlights looking anymore in his eyes, where it's like, or he's not saying "by gum" as much, though that is the line that ends the movie. So I mean, he, he yes, his his performance has changed, 
And Lawton, of course, again, is playing the actor, playing the actor. I mean, he's showing uh, Hobson doing a performance for his daughters. You know, I'm the sickly old man. Please take care of me and don't be mean to me. And, you know, don't try to take my shop and be nice to me and visit me. And, you know, it's, it's, he's playing the suffering father. I think Lawton adds that dimension to Hobson that's sort of suggested in the play, but absent a specific performance isn't really there. Clearly, more explicitly, I think, than you have in the, the neutral context of the play. Yeah, Will dressed like Hobson. Um, you know, he's tucking his fingers into his vest like Hobson has been doing. He's got the watch chain going across his vest. Um, they're not exactly mirrors, but clearly they have they have completed the sort of emotional shift in positions in terms of mastery and dominance and in terms of where they stand in the social hierarchy. What Lean, I think, does most explicitly here, and I think we've suggested this in, in many scenes before, is use Maggie as the fulcrum in terms of the visual dynamism that he brings to the staging, use her as the emotional center, and use her shifting back and forth between her father and Will uh, to sort of resolve for the audience all the conflicts, and it's a comedy ended on a sort of happy if not prosperous for all concerned, at least resolved and comfortable ending for all concerned. It's an interesting scene because not only does she shift loyalties and visually shifts along with it to show the loyalty shift, but also you're never quite sure when she takes her father's side, you're never quite sure whether she's testing him or not, whether it's a matter of her saying I've sort of put you up to this, to put her husband up to this statement that, uh, you know, what should say, what they should say on the sign, whether it's the late Hobson or not. So, I mean, it's a real ambiguity. I mean, how much of this has she staged? You know, how much of this has she planned in her head? Uh, is it all stage managed or not? Well, I think the ambiguity is, is purposed and has been sort of part of it. I think what we've been saying about the staging even in the in the lighting, the, the the set dressing, you had Hobson earlier when he saw that that he was in dire straits, walking up to the picture of his wife. Presumably, that's his wife, Mary, on the mantle, and Lean has used that as sort of a shifting piece of background to constantly reinforce the sense of family and how families are disrupted and then coalesce and come back together in a different way. The resolution that takes place here, I think, is much more focused than it is in the play, um, much more brought into Lean's worldview um, than it is in the play. And, and of course, here we're presented with the, the final Hobson's choice, which is, you know, I'm going to take over this company, this, this shop, or, you know, you're going you're gonna to suffer and, and, and die alone here with your alcoholism. And that's the and of course that's no choice at all. I mean, obviously he's presented with a take it or leave it situation. And he, and he's presented it in the same context as the first dilemma that he had when he came to the cellar to visit them. Except now they're in his house, uh, albeit at his invitation. And again, Lean is staging this as a two against one. Um, but not only is it a two against one, they're standing, Hobson seated. Um, you know, he's had his last shot with his proposal, and, and now essentially he's provided um, Hobson with no alternative by visually reinforcing his emotional situation. I think also what we'll see, and here we actually see what you're talking about, is the actual start to shifting of her visually across the frame, and there we have it. And where she's, But again, we're never sure whether she just wants him to stand up to her, and, and that's what she sort of indicates later on is that in a way he's she's she set this up so that he will defy her and then even show to the father wow this guy has become a true man and it's the traditional definition of a man and he's changed completely i think it's clear that the ambiguity is purpose you have her lining up initially sort of like in profile like the picture of her mother on the mantle and then you've got the raking two shot over hops and towards her but then lean pans her back over to willie and there's a certain amount of ambiguity, but it's clear that the resolution is satisfactory to her. She's changed this man. Um, she's turned him into a much better version of her father. 
And that's somebody with whom she can comfortably spend the rest of her life. And she's also shown her father that, hey, the fact that you start in circumstances that are not perfect uh, doesn't mean that you can't come up out of the cellar and become successful at many levels. And of course, the, the whole imagery of the cellar is is used very effectively by Lean in that Lawton falls into a cellar when the beginning of his downfall when he falls into the beanstalk cellar. So it's sort of the irony of the film is that we see Hobson's fall visually into that cellar, the same kind of cellar that Willie has now worked himself up from and has now become the owner of this shop. It's all right. I won't be half so certain as I sounded. But, but you told me to be strong and use the power that's come to me through you. You know, words came to me, mouth that made me jump at my own boldness. And as he's saying right here, the sky's the limit. You know, I, I've gone from a cellar to Salford in this shop, and who knows what's next. You know, the high street in Manchester, uh, the sky's the limit. It's an interesting resolution in terms of the classic Victorian work ethic and other things that weren't necessarily at play in in the Brig House original, but which to lean are sort of key looking back on an era from a much greater distance than Brig House did. Even though he has defied her, you know, in quotes, defied her about the name on the sign, it's clear that he admits to her dominance. And in fact, by saying that you, you made me, you know, I'm, I'm the man. You, you made me that man. And so it's always, it's always clear that he's aware of who he is and how he got that way, and he's never going to become like Hobson and attempting to somehow you know, humiliate her in some well, way. Well, hopefully not. And, and yeah, I think you're right. With the scene where he surprised her by saying he'd paid off the 120 pounds, and she said she just wanted a piece of the pie, and he clearly says you made the whole pie. There wouldn't be a possibility for me without you. I think that's a situation that I think is really significant. It's there in the original play, but in terms of 1954 Western society, looking back on something in 1880, it's, it's still a significant statement about the fact that social strictures are things that need to be tested. And I think the resolution that you have here going out into the square, uh, the, the sort of dynamic ending, it's positive in the way a comedy should be, but it's, it's also positive in terms of the way that Lean would, like many of the best filmmakers, inject something additional into any concept. And it's an ongoing irony with someone like David Lean, who had a remarkably successful career, that one has to constantly be defending his skills. I don't think it takes really more than a picture like this to demonstrate the depth and brilliance of Lean and that it was at work in all of his movies, not just in movies like Lawrence of Arabia or Ryan's Daughter. Hopefully, as more of his pictures are available, more and more people will come to realize just how significant and remarkable a filmmaker he was. Mm -hmm.